Hello. I'm Ruth Dunning, and I'm very proud to have been invited to take part in this first evening of ITA television. It's a big night for all of us, and we do hope you're enjoying yourself. Now, you'll be seeing quite a bit of me in the future in some of the TV advertisements for Purcell, interviewing some interesting people. Tonight, though, I'm here to present the Purcell children to you. You've met them before, but here they are on TV for the first time. The commercials unveiled on the opening night of independent television were gentle and reassuring, a far cry from the brash American salesmanship so many had feared. With their cartoons, jingles and repetitive voiceovers, they instantly won the approval of children. Murray Mintz, Murray Mintz, too good to hurry Mintz. Murray Mintz, Murray Mintz, too good to hurry Mintz. Commercials were wonderful because commercials were short, commercials were repetitive, and commercials used music in the form of the old jingle a great deal, and it replaced very quickly in their minds the old nursery rhyme. Bird's eye peas, sweet as the moment, sweet as the moment when the pot went up. Many working class children in particular were sung to sleep with advertisement jingles. Um, jingles were a part of the culture. Jingles were like nursery rhymes, but much better known. What's the happiest way of eating fish? Bird's eye fish fingers. They could sing the jingles, they knew all the words, they could recite the dialogue. And because of this, a great many people said that children were going to be brainwashed into wanting the product. Hello there. Sooty's making some soup. Looks a bit watery and tasteless to me. Oh, an oxo cube. Oh, that's different, Sooty. A little bird told me to tell you birds is best. That's right. That's what I told him. Real cream, real cream, real cream. Though many of the early commercials looked infantile, they were actually designed to appeal to adults. The early commercials now do look as though we were talking like a patient parent to a child, like, like uh, children's television. At this time of year, you need Bovril every day. Thank you, little Bovril. That's some advice we can all take. We had the idea that commercials were to explain things to people. We built our commercials brick by brick and tried to make sure that people understood. We believed, we had been taught by Americans about the value of repetition, of saying the same thing many times, of never overestimating the intelligence of the public. Good old mum, she always remembers to bring home some Walls ice cream. But good old mum didn't always approve of being treated like a child. More sophisticated advertising saw the advantages of addressing her as a mother. What is a mum? A mum is someone to come home to. A mum is someone who says, sit down please to eat your tea. Few brands exploited mother love with quite the same intensity as Persil. In the world of washing powders, the ultimate test of a good mother was her devotion to the children's wash. A mum is someone who uses Persil in her washing machine because she knows that Persil is gentle but thorough. It gets clothes that important bit whiter. In food commercials, a woman was judged by the quality of her children's diet, an emotive subject in the recent aftermath of rationing. Them a power of good too, because Marmite contains essential B2 vitamins and you'll find it helps to keep your family fit. They're working up a really healthy appetite. And you know just how important it is to feed them properly with the protein that builds strong muscles and sturdy bones. Even sweets like Mars were sold with a strong nutritional message. Helps you play. Yes, Mars does all this because Mars contains glucose and sugar to give you energy while you work, milk to nourish you while you relax, chocolate to keep you going while you play, the child of 1950s advertising was regularly depicted as frail and vulnerable, tucked up in bed by an ever-vigilant mother. The young man is lying ill in bed. Or is he? Hey, you should be in bed. And that's right where mother will put you. Yes, sickness came with winter. Colds and flu, rife in the 50s, aroused genuine fears. Achoo. Achoo. 
stop. Many brands offered to come to the rescue. By morning, you would never believe he could be so much better. Get New Vic, an antiseptic cold treatment with every breath. At this time of year, you need Bovril every day, especially if colds and flu are about. In homes and hospitals everywhere, in the fight back to health, Lucozade aids recovery. We had a society in which central heating hardly existed. And a corollary of that was that influenza was absolutely epidemic. So Lucozade was an essential uh, product. It was in no sense a, a minority or a frivolous product. It was an essential product, which was part and parcel of the business of everyday living and getting people back on the road after sickness. A tissue, a tissue, a tissue. Well, I suppose there was a tendency in the early days of independent television for manufacturers of certain food products to include rather outrageous nutritionist claims, which really were not wholly justified. Regular hot bovril to build up his resistance to infection. And there were often many meetings involved in advertising agencies and officials, uh, including the expert in the field, to ensure that future claims were going to reflect what the product actually contained. For Lucozade, with its high concentration of liquid glucose, is safe, quick, proved, and easily taken by everyone. Many doctors agree that vitamin C will help build up resistance to colds and chills, so you had Ribena every day. Whilst health drinks offered protection against an inhospitable climate, other brands offered to protect the child from perils which lurked closer to home. Children are beautiful. Harpic is not beautiful. It does an ugly job, and it does it ruthlessly. They don't know about dangerous germs, but you do. You know that Domestus makes toilets germ-free and bleach white. Even the washing up was a potential source of child contamination. Now you know it's clean. So clean it's safe enough for even him to eat off. With new personal liquid, you can now make sure all your dishes are so clean, they're safe for your family. There were even hidden risks from a woman's breath. Can she be certain her whole mouth is pure? As pure as if she'd used an antiseptic mouthwash? Now, Signal is here. If mothers had to provide total clinical protection, what they expected in return were clean, well-behaved children who were helpful around the house and always came when called. Come on, children. Tea's ready. They always ate in silence. And when they were allowed to speak, their first word appropriately enough was mummy. Spell mummy. M-U-M-Y. Mummy says when I grow up and get married, I'll walk into wars with money to spend. And mummy says I have to look at the rhyme, please. Of course. Mummy wants a new hover because she's got lots of work to do. This is how little girls learn. Doing what mum does and saying what mum says. But these perfect children weren't simply employed to pull on mother's heartstrings. They also had a job to perform, asking mother a few pertinent questions. Why do babies sleep so much? To help them to grow. Does sleep help Peter to grow? Sleep and cow and gait. What's this, Mummy? Heinz tomato soup, darling. What Heinz? Our favourite. Do you want it soft? Oh, yes, that's most important. Why? Well, it helps keep my hands soft all the time I'm washing up. The hands that do dishes can feel soft as your face With mild green fairy liquid Washing up is not really very interesting. Uh, and this dialogue enables the advertiser to explain the merits of fairy liquid again and again without seeming just idiotic. Why? Because the relationship between the mother and her little girl is part of being a successful mum. Why? This is the mum who always answers the questions, who is patient, who is funny, who doesn't say, shut up, or if you ask me another question, I'll scream. Why? But children weren't simply recruited to inquire about brands, they were also encouraged to pester for them. A tube of Smarties means lots and lots of chocolate beans. Yes, you get lots and lots and lots and lots of Smarties. Buy some for Lulu. Why not ask your mum and dad to bring home a Walls family brick? 
Mum got this from the grocer. Your mum ought to do the same. Why not ask her? Don't forget my fruit gums, Mum. I just love those fruit gums, Mum. Round Tree's fruit gums last the longest. That's why we all say. Don't forget the fruit gums, Mum. Don't forget the fruit gums, Mum. Here one is using the power of television to get the, 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 the very young child to pester mother. So we were forced to introduce a what we call a no pestering rule. So that even in today's code, we're now talking about 1989, uh, where it makes it very clear you may not include any reference in the commercial to ask mother to buy. Roundtree's cleverly accommodated the rule by changing don't forget the fruit gums mum to don't forget the fruit gums chum. Inciting children to pester may have been banned, but free gifts and special offers gave advertisers a legal alternative. Ring my bell, come and squeeze me. A big, big model of me for only eight and six. Submarine dead ahead. Stand by. And no ordinary sub either. It's a real working model of the world's first atomic power sub, which dives and surfaces in water all by itself with baking powder for fuel. A wonderful offer from Vim. New pen knife, Jimmy? Yes, smashing, isn't it? And look, it's got two stainless steel blades made in Sheffield. Though children were easily bribed to influence the family shop, they had a few purchases to make themselves. With an eye on their pocket money, Walls began to target children with greater precision. So we took, first of all, the very logical approach that all children were divided by age. And of course, anyone who uh, knows anything about children understands that you can get a three to five year old who probably has more in common with a five to seven year old. Uh, therefore, age was not really the discriminator. It was much better to classify them by their particular interests. Research by Walls revealed three types of children. Adventurers, Hungry Horaces, and Little Madams. Little Madams were girls, of course, who knew very much what they wanted when they went to the shop. Some people know exactly what they want and where to get it. Whereas there were, for instance, adventurers who were interested more in the shape, in the extrinsics of the ice cream, more interested in the wrapper. Enjoy a double flavoured lolly today. Get a Wolves booster and take off for the moon. Hungry Horaces were children who basically, for their threatens, wanted as much ice cream as they could cram into their face. Bacon, ham, Ned, raspberry, or lemon, or strawberry, it's new. Oh, Wolves Whopper! From the very beginning, cartoons were a mainstay of children's advertising. What a whopper! Ha ha ha! Lots more fun! It's kind of a children's language, a cartoon. So they immediately know it's meant for them. Secondly, there's a problem with children watching other children in commercials. Uh, Live-action children. They very often don't like them. And uh, so if it's a cartoon, it gets over that problem. Because that issue doesn't raise itself. And thirdly, you can do things with cartoon characters that you couldn't possibly do with real people. Hitting people over the head and things, and it's, it's a joke. Whereas if it was for real, it would be just fine. Tony and the Hunter, another super energy story. One of the most popular cartoon heroes was Tony the Tiger. When he first appeared on TV, he was depicted as aggressive and fearless. I wouldn't miss my Kellogg Sugar Frosted Flakes. He had sharp teeth and a very loud roar. Great! He had a black American accent and was very arrogant. On me, boy. Throw the spotlight on me. With time, his personality was to change. Kellogg's filed down his teeth and turned him into a lovable loser who'd appeal to children of all ages. Hey, Tony, you better see the dog. I just saw it. As far as children are concerned, he's very obviously not a child. But I think part of the success of Tony is that you can't actually ascribe a role to him. He's whatever the children want him to be. Oh, boy. Children by the age of eight or nine, particularly boys, aren't perhaps that interested in just a cuddly tiger. What they are interested in is the inbuilt joke. OK, let's race. Watch this. Tony thinks he's the great cool hero, and yet he always gets caught out. <laughs> Girls, as far as a character like Tony is concerned, respond much more to his vulnerability and his charm as a... Tony, what happened? Yeah, skip it. And I think it really is a case of feminists eat your heart out when you're talking about children under the age of 11. They are very sex stereotypical. Hey, I'm 
I'm going to build a super Lego transporter with a crane. Well, I'm going to build this beautiful Lego house. No, I'm going to build a real Lego tractor. Advertisers' faith in the innate differences between the sexes was nowhere more apparent than in the toy commercial. Look who's coming. It's baby first step. She walks just like you did when you were a toddler. Oops, quick, pick her up and give her a cuddle. Real tough toys, the real tough boy, Tonka! Give boy Tonka toy, mighty tough. <laughs> If you're using girls in commercials, you have to be extremely careful about alienating the boys. Little girls, on the other hand, are much more flexible. They will accept a boy winning in a commercial. Now, I'm not saying this is particularly a good thing, but it's actually what ha what's happening in real life. I don't think you can blame the advertisers for this. It's a function of the society we live in. In the mid-60s, a popular gender stereotype was the mischievous boy. His arrival in commercials reflected a shift in attitudes towards child-rearing. One no longer liked these model children. They were a kind of child that nobody really wanted to have. And you could be proud of your child if he was a little devil. And when they're well, how on earth do you keep up with them? Because to be a devil was to be healthy and normal and uh, independent. These naughty little boys invariably committed the same crime, unsupervised eating between meals. You could eat a million and still want more. You don't have to butter them. You can eat them anywhere. And you get up to 65 crackers in a box. Myself, I'm using 48. Of course, Aunt Pet doesn't know yet, but I'm sure she'll be pleased. Break eggs, save money. Break eggs, save money. If the independent child was now acceptable in commercials, so too was his unruly peer group, the gang. Funny faces, hey, hey, hey. Funny faces, hey, hey, hey. Trust walls to have the good ideas. They make such good ice cream. Get funny faces from your wall shop today. The strength of the gang is that it gives you license to do all sorts of things. I mean, gangs are associated with sort of forms of rebellion or naughtiness. And so it becomes quite a sophisticated tool that advertisers can make use of because children will want to be part of it. Have you got a use for the tubes when you've finished eating the yeah, smarties? When they're empty, I'll stamp on them and they go pop. What a lot you've got, yeah. Even toddlers, previously tied to their mother's apron strings, could be seen mimicking the antics of their teenage brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. Smarties, smarties, smarties. Smarties. The exciting new group. The Ramblers playing Burns' electric guitar. You can win a guitar like theirs in a great new Kellogg's Rice Krispies competition. The teenager became, for the first time, a major target for advertising and advertisers in the 60s because this represented the first really economically viable teenage market ever in Europe. And for the first time, the teenager had the money and also the money to purchase products which were not necessary necessities. Manfred Mann. Ooh! Animals. Yes! Joe. Please! A mystery group. Ooh! There was a, a kind of interesting collision between availability money, advertisers and their agencies identifying that the teenagers had enormous spending power and had influence, to ev had influence over other people's spending power and the fact that they, they were very media aware. That generation, which is the generation a few years younger than me, were enormously media aware, so they were easy to get at. What is a teenager? Well, I am, I suppose. I just started work. Proper caper it is, too. Still, the money's good. I like a few sweets now and again, but I'm particular. Only the best. That's why I buy Roundtree's fruit gums. In portraying teenagers, advertisers had a problem. 
They had to make them lifelike while steering a difficult path around the reputation of the badly behaved teddy boy. Brown fruit gums are always top of the hip parade with us. In their first attempts, advertisers came up with young adults for whom the height of sophistication was admission to their parents' dinner and dance circuit. Mary, guess where I was last night? <laughs> yes, Harry took me out. We went dancing. And my hair really was a terrific success. Another teenage stereotype was the self-conscious song and dance routine. We're gonna hold it up, up to the light, for there's not a stain and shining white. It's the new home firm for lovely girls. Keep dancing, waves of lively curls. Duet, the liquid cream home firm. Duet, duet, duet. Jude is pretty and Jude is good, but little Judy never, never could resist the chocks in Dairy Box, those lovely centers in Dairy Box. However enchanting to adults, these stiff theatrical poses failed to impress the youth market. Before long, teenagers would have to be portrayed with more abandon. <laughs> R.K. Record! With the new Kellogg's American Kellogg's rock and roll may have been condemned as decadent, but nervous advertisers could no longer afford to ignore its appeal. 1918, 3, 4, 5, pick a lucky number and away you jive. Agencies had to learn that the teenage market was extremely responsive to visual symbolism and sound. Pick a lucky number cause the taste just heaven! So advertisers went and looked and listened to the pop promotion men. Ready, Steady, Go became as important to them as any other program. Top ten! Top, 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 top ten! Taste that new flip-flavoured ice cream! Bite into that crunchy chocolate crumble! As British pop and the cult of teenage gained momentum, brands repositioned to cash in. Snap, crackle and pop! Snap, crackle and pop! The Rice Krispies, an innocent children's cereal, even hired the Rolling Stones to change their image. Wake up in the morning, there's a slap around the place. Wake up in the morning, there's a crackle in your face. Wake up in the morning, there's a pop that really says Rice Krispies for you and you and you. For on the milk and listen to the stand that says it's nice. For on the milk and listen to the crackle of that rice. Get up in the morning to the pop that says it's rice. Hear them talking, Chris. Rice Krispies! But being a teenager wasn't all fun. It's like I'm invisible. You're the hit. Why? What's that? The Colgate Ring of Confidence. As advertisers constantly reminded them, the problems of adolescence were never far away. Working close to people, you must be careful about your breath. Nervous perspiration could catch you out, could lead to odour. Joe used to worry. He was always checking his hair. Can he be certain his whole mouth is pure? As pure as if he'd used an antiseptic mouthwash? And I suddenly thought, have I got B.O.? In exploiting teenage fears, advertisers were ruthlessly rational. Teenagers are going through a number of anxieties, some would say neuroses, as they mature. And it is logical that one or two of these neuroses will be about how others perceive them whether as an acceptable person or as a love object. But I still didn't seem to be getting anywhere with Jean. Then a friend told me why. P.O. So clearly here was a product category that was particularly relevant to teenagers, but also, of course, was relevant to uh, the rest of the family as well. Living at today's non-stop pace, it's harder than ever to stay fresh. So say no to B.O. with new Lifebuoy Toilet Soap. Now more effective against B.O. than ever. Use it every day for non-stop protection. While young people wrestled with body odour, adult society had to try to keep up with their non-stop pace. Energen leads the march against starch. 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 March against starch with Energen starch reduced crisp bread. In the mid-60s, you get the teenage world or the, the, the youth culture and its values and all the things that the youth dream seem to, to be about takes over everything. The teenage values which came from the street had become the new social acceptable aspirational style. The speed, mobility, youth. That the 60s was an age when everybody was 
seeking a new youth. <laughs> But as the decade drew to a close, the dream based on speed, affluence and youth was about to crash. Nice and easy does it. The Times examines the student's attitude to authority. The Times asks, is it the bright students who demonstrate or the not so bright? The boom on which the whole idea of the teenager had been predicated had stopped in 1966. Students in Revolt, a six-day series, starts tomorrow in The Times. You had teens confusing purchasing power with political power in 1968 and causing riots. You also had the start of youth unemployment in the early 70s. All this meant that there was no unified youth market for advertisers to address, so you start to get cracks in the teenage dream. What did you live for at 16? A bike, music, a girlfriend? You had no skills, no qualifications. So where are you now? As teenagers disappeared from the screen, a new kind of child was to take center stage in advertising. I cannot understand why I'm the why. Sensible and mature people. I wanted a real character, you know, an ugly kid with spots who was real. You could touch her and you, you felt that, you know, she was a real person. You put a little bag each week into her room. The hallmark of this new, more realistic child was a tendency to make mistakes. And surprisingly, this was just what the advertisers wanted. And your money grows, the interest rates are quite considerable. And tomorrow, let's not have I got where I am today and to think two years ago. I had nothing. If the kid made a mistake, if the kid put a finger in its mouth, uh, that was fine. It didn't matter because it just reminded you that this was a real kid. It's Heinz baked beans for breakfast because that's what we have Heinz. Baked beans. Mum says they make me strong. <coughs> I don't know where Heinz beans come from, but I know where they go. The Heinz beans kids were more natural. They, they came from different parts of the country. They weren't all little, little uh, uh, elocutory bourgeois. I always eat his beans up. They were more like uh, the, the viewers' own children. Don't be mean with the beans, Mum. Beans means Heinz. Even stage school children were allowed regional accents in their new character parts. Here, yeah, what do you think you two are doing? Didn't you say I'm just not to eat for an hour? Don't fret, Mary. I'll have my fall later. Don't you like weddings, Ben? No, I can't stand none of this fancy food. Give me beef burgers any day. You can't have beef burgers at a wedding, silly. But while childhood was acquiring a new realism, it was also being plundered for an idealized innocence. Think about the sunshine, think about the summertime, think about the children doing as they please. Gales, 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 pass the honey, please. In an uncertain economic climate, children symbolized a golden era. A mother's own childhood was now nostalgically repackaged and sold to her with the product. School days were the happiest days of your life, except they weren't at the time. Childhood was horrible. People always told you to do things. You had spots on your face. You kept falling over. But really looking back, and it was wonderful. We all lived like the Hovis kids. We all lived in this wonderful golden world. And it's recollection and tranquility, isn't it? Now I stop on round would be old my Peggotty's place. It was like taking bread to the top of the world. It was a grand ride back, though. I remember my mother giving it to me all those summers ago. But while mothers were offered an escape into the past, they were also exhorted to provide their families with a refuge from the present. You turned on like I told you to, did you? Egg bacon, Heinz spaghetti. How was the cooking? 
Porridge isn't half good out of those billies, isn't it? Not too many mosquitoes, I hope. Weather all right, was it? Not too rainy. Oh, and the songs. King gang, gooly, 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 watch you. King gang, goo, king gang, goo, king gang. Spaghetti all right, love? It's nice to be home, mum. King gang, goo. Did you win today, love? Yes, 15 nil. If the world was a damp and dismal place, Mother was always waiting at home, ready to console and comfort with the help of the brand. Cup of waffle. Yes, please, Mum. Come on out, Tim. Don't be ridiculous. You mustn't take life so seriously. Will you come out for a biscuit? I wonder why I wasn't invited to Karen's party. The children were seen as vulnerable. The children were often seen as victims. At this point in the 70s, there were questions being asked, not least by the mums. Many other mums were going out to work. She perhaps wanted to go back to work. Was it a good thing to do? What happens to the kids then? The traditional pull-push that every woman feels in that situation was coming to a head in the mid-70s. So it was a reassurance to the mother that it was OK to go on being a traditional mother because they needed you and you shouldn't feel bad about it. Once Mum and the product had done their bit, there was often a one-liner at the end to show the world had been put to rights. Next week we're gonna make paper animals. I'm looking forward next week. It's nice to be home, Mum. In those uh, commercials, uh, what you've got is a, a sense of uh, very, very settled values still. And this is at a time, of course, when undercurrents were operating in exactly the opposite direction. You had an incipient explosion in the divorce rate and so on and so forth. But I think there was a sense in which there was a groping for idealistic values of family, which were already being eroded by a whole range of economic, social and, and indeed moral um, circumstances. But if in reality mothers were spending less time with their children, advertisers promised to help. And regular brushing with Signal 2. Their brands were now sold as babysitters. And you can't always be there. You can't always keep an eye on the family, but you can watch over them. You want to protect your children. Well, Colgate plus MFP fluoride helps with their teeth. With the help of the brand, mothers could extend their protection beyond the home, into the bleak outer world. At times like this, you need your breakfast cereal to give you all the warmth you can get. Ready breakfast. Central heating for kids. The only thing between your family and the big rough world outside is their clothes and you. With the right fabric conditioner, children could carry motherly love wherever they went. There is no doubt that the member of the family who, in mother's eyes, needs softness most is the younger member of the family. And I had the idea of the extended protective womb. And the idea was that if you clothed them in softness, that softness could, could go with them and you were with them. And later, when the film is resolved, you see the child coming back home from school and he leaps into his mother's arms and the extended womb has withdrawn and the child is back home again. This is a thing called as the 70s drew to a close, many brands would fight shy of the sentimental use of children. The 80s child was less vulnerable and had a mind of its own. I think the most important thing about Thatcher's children is that compared to their forebears in the 50s and, and 60s, they are far more adult as children. They are far less naive. Uh, they are far more worldly wise. They are far more realistic. Well, it's for the kids. That was pathetic. Yeah, and two quid of it was mine. That's nice. 80s children invariably had the measure of the adults around. How did you keep up with the QE2, Granddad? I was in there swimming pools, son! My mum always gets the cabbage's fingers out when there's a birthday in the house. There's been a lot of birthdays lately. Kevin? Where exactly did you bury the car? In the sand! I'm... I'm not helping much, am I, Dad? No. Children are now 
many adults, they grow out of their babyhood extremely quickly. Our attitude to children has changed quite dramatically to make children more self-sufficient, actually, to equip them to, to deal with the modern world, um, to get on with their own lives, to be autonomous, to make them very much more like many adults. Working nine to five, what service and devotion with petite nine nines. The problem of portraying this adult child could be solved with one simple device, an adult voiceover. Do you think if I eat champion soft grain, I'll grow up like you? No, I don't think so, Harry. Get this, Lou, they've lost their garden gnome at number 17. This could be big. Another milkshake? Hmm. Huh. Don't mind if I do. Jockey topping? Ah, no, well, I don't oh, know. Oh, go on, go on. Those tender homecomings of the 70s had become an advertiser's joke. Feed me. Did the teacher like your project? Feed me! Sometimes you instinctively know what they want. Feed me down! The monster of child demand was no mere fiction. Feed me! Advertisers now turned their attention to the rise of pester power. As a term, what it means is where you are using children to initiate the purchase of particular types of product which they might eat or make use of, but they aren't historically associated with the purchasing decision. With children taking an interest in the entire family shop, advertisers could target them quite legally by promising fun. Foods were brightly packaged, and new characters developed specifically to appeal to children. This is Bean Street, and we're the Bean Street Kids. Noodle Doodle came to town with lots of straight spaghetti. Twisted it around and around and around, now this is what you get. And if the new cast contained antisocial elements, it was just a sign of the times. If you wanted to find a very accurate symbol of an age, you would actually look at the sort of... Uh, puppet characters which uh, appeal to children, which we've been using, for instance, to advertise uh, some peanut butter. Now, Gilbert, who is uh, that particular puppet character, is anarchic. Now you're talking. Uh, mad. Uh, he's zany. And he's the exact opposite of the uh, very, very um, discreet, charming, and, of course, completely chaperoned puppet of the 1950s. But anarchy could stray perilously close to thuggery. <laughs> We live in the age of football hooligans and uh, trouble in the streets and skinheads and all that. And there they are on screen. The Weetabix kids have got Dr. Martin boots on, they've got braces. Um, you know, they're pretty rough lot. If you know what's good for you, you do. Okay. The Weetabix. If you know what's good for you. In the brutal 80s, even the most cosseting brands forsook motherly warmth for athletic dynamism. I know what breakfast is all about. It's ready break, there ain't no doubt. Street survival, it seemed, was close to the heart of the 80s child. When I grow up, I want to be strong. Big deal. <laughs> and 30% more fibre. Bar's Iron Brew, made in Scotland from Gardas. If children were being tempted by inflated promises, they still appeared to know what was really best for them. Protein. Pardon? Beef's a viable source of protein. We did it in school last week. Laura. Margarine. Well, why didn't you just put margarine? Something to do with Polly Watson names. As you travel around a supermarket with this super-educated brat, your child is telling you what you should and shouldn't buy. Uh, may even be telling you nutritional as well as fun messages, because remember, they pick up everything. No artificial colours or preservatives. And this may even go as far as perhaps children influencing the type of car you buy, particularly when it's the family car. Does Johnny want to come in Uncle Tom's Nova? I think in the old days, there always was a very clearly defined rite of passage, which meant that at a certain point, you ceased being a kid and became a teenager. In, in uh, brand marketing, that doesn't happen now. Kids are teenagers at the age of six or seven, I sometimes think. What you've actually got is the rise of the child 
uh, and or teenager as a professional consumer. And the same habits of consumption which are being um, trained and inculcated into children at a very early age are manifesting themselves as they move through into, if you like, new wave teenagerdom. So the techniques are being learnt much, much younger, which means that you've got a, a continuum now of experience, which you simply didn't have in the 1950s or 1960s when kids were innocent and teenagers weren't. The teenagers of the 80s and the advertising aimed at them came to be known as New Wave. These 16 to 24 year olds had no doubts about what they wanted. Halifax spelt out with embarrassing frankness the aspirations of a new generation. What I want. The young people don't seem to have the fantasies, the dreams, the need to kick against the traces that young people in the 60s or in particular are associated with. They're actually very quick to conform, they're very reactionary, they're very traditional, they're very much governed by the market forces which seems to be the pervading philosophy of this country under Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> this new conformity has nowhere been more evident than in bank commercials. Fast cut, degraded images are regularly deployed to lure the new wave into bank accounts and debt. In these commercials, they're often seen pulling off deals. I'd like a checkbook when I start work. <laughs> when you start work? Right. Right. Did we get it? Yeah. Oh. And that's not all. You get the contract for 150,000. Congratulations. Mark? One of the problems that besets New Wave Young is that they are now being trained to consume as early middle-aged people. Brilliant. It's a deal. I.e., people who are 15 to 24 are expected to consume like people often 10 years older than they are. And they don't have the same amount of money. It used to be that if you were a teenager that you were without responsibilities. Now people have been encouraged to take on responsibilities at a much younger age. Dreams are like angels. Financial responsibilities were not the only burden of this generation. Love is the light, scaring darkness away. Yeah. Heroin? I don't know what all this fuss is about. I could handle it. But victims of bleak urban settings weren't confined to health warnings. Control it. I could stop. New wave advertising has drawn repeatedly from metropolis-like images of a machine-age nightmare. I need a personal transporter for my work. It's my duty to tell you. Won't you even discuss it? An input deficiency. Is there anyone I can talk to about no control? Why can't I just talk to somebody? The challenge to the young was not to go under. Advertising exhorted them to buy the right brands and survive the ordeal. Seiko performs. The rest is up to you. But if the pressures of the present proved too much to bear, reassurance was on hand in the form of a nostalgic teenage past. I think it's been very interesting that you've had um, a great wash of 50s imagery and music throughout advertising during the last few years. What it is selling to new wave youth is a time when teenagers were first valued for themselves, when they first had purchasing power, when they were free to actually be themselves as opposed to be the young adults which are expected to be now. 
but I'll be seeing you around, okay? They look back to the 50s um, for th those sorts of hard images, but they've sanitized it. What they want is the style, the hairdos, the clothes, without really wanting to connect with the issues of, of really being a teenager, which have to do much more with assessing the world you're in and seeing if you're going to break away from it or not. But on the eve of the 90s, there were faint signs of new, less materialistic teenage values. There's a new trend just beginning to emerge. I don't know whether into the future it's going to get bigger, but it's certainly just beginning now to show that there is something more than mere mechanistic control or mere man as machine or mere urban decay. And Pepe, Rain Dance commercial, is a particularly good example of this, actually. It shows these two young kids um, in a very dull and grey environment. But in parallel, there's a piece of magic going on. There's this rain dance happening with these Indians, something exotic, something romantic, something from another world that, that they can recognise and understand, that the brand can bring to them. And it's a very interesting development that perhaps there is hope, perhaps there is another way, perhaps um, there's more to life, if you like, than, um, than just what's on the surface. But for the moment, the Pepe teenagers are the exceptions. Their idealism literally worlds apart from the rest of their generation. It seems that really we do have a generation of grocer's children from Grantham and what will be the challenge of the 90s is to see if that does change. There was an awful lot of talk about Acid House and was this the beginning of Young People's Rebellion? Is it a return to the hippies of the 60s? And so on and so forth. I really don't believe that was a lasting trend indicating that young people's attitudes are going to change. I think there is such a great commitment now to consumer and consumer values that I can't see any signs of it sadly changing in the near future. for free but you can give them to the birds and bees I want money that's what I want There's more from Washes Whiter next week Tonight though we're staying in Adland but going back to 1960s New York Bad behaviour and saucy antics from the Mad Men next But your love won't pay my bills I want money that's what I want.